Back in the summer, uh, when we were preparing for a mission trip to Guatemala and thinking through uh, other mission opportunities and the general scope and, and how far reaching we wanted to go, um, I, I was at a loss because I just didn't have a lot of experience doing that. And uh, <clears throat> through several conversations, uh, some that uh, our staff initiated with me and, and others, um, I was like, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there were someone around that is involved in the life of the church, a Sunday school member, uh, serving food on Wednesday nights in the mission meal line, who just so happened to have spent over a decade on the mission field and has a lot of pastoral experience. And uh, wouldn't it be great if that person were just sitting out in the pew? And surprise, surprise, that person was sitting out in the pew. <laughs> and uh, so, Don, you can come up. Uh, this has been a conversation a long time in the making. Um, we've had several meetings with personnel committees, finance committees, deacons. And um, so we're excited for the opportunity before us uh, that Don would be a part of what we're, God is doing here at Hopewell. Don, you share what's on your heart. Morning, church. What we can often forget is that Jesus lays down the foundational philosophy to guide his church before he ascends and allows the church to be formed. We can almost call the foundational philosophy the story of two mountains. After Jesus rises from the dead, he spends 40 days in appearing to various groups of disciples, making it clear he has indeed risen from the dead. He indicated to Mary Magdalene that something important was going to take place in Galilee, and Matthew records the meeting Galilee on a particular mountain, though we don't have it identified. Jesus' rationale in making this pronouncement in Galilee may very well be because of Galilee's identification with Gentiles, because of all the trade routes that ran through, indicating this is not a Jewish message, this is a universal message. Well, what is the message? Let me read it to you quickly. We're in Matthew 28, if you want to follow along, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You know that forever we've called this the Great Commission. In this commissioning by the Lord, He gives three overtones of command, but only one true command. The overtones start with the idea of going. The way that this is constructed in the original language, he's not giving us a specific command to go. Uh, what he's telling us is that as we go, we're to do some things. This means as we go about our daily life, we have a specific command as his people. It also means that he has the right to interrupt our normal life and send us to do something specific. The second overtone comes in the word baptizing. Baptizing is not a specific command. It flows out of the specific command. And like baptism, just as important as this phrase, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. This flows out of command. So there is only one true command in that whole passage, and here it is. Make disciples. There's nothing wrong in counting things in the New Testament. We know that we have accounts about how many people, well, how many men were fed by the loaves and the fishes. But we have become obsessed in our lives these days with counting, especially in the evangelical church. So we count conversions. We count professions of faith. We count how many people prayed to receive Christ. But the master of the harvest, the Lord of the church, before he ever launched the church, told us what the standard is. We need to count disciples. Flash forward a few days from that mountain in Galilee. Jesus has now moved to the Mount of Olives, looking down on Jerusalem. Because of these appearances that he's made, including the one on the mountain in Galilee, I don't think that the disciples who were gathered there had any forewarning about what was about to take place. Here's what went down in Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive unto them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they come together, they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. What? Can you imagine the startling nature? You've been spending 40 days with this guy walking around getting specific instructions. You've already visited one mountain. You're now on another mountain. And suddenly he gives you this overwhelming message and disappears. And so now they've got to figure out how to follow those instructions. So they do. They go back to Jerusalem. They're going to have plenty of time to remember the words and to contemplate what they mean for it takes 10 days for everything to take place before they are going to be empowered. So in those 10 days from the earthly side, they're constantly going to be looking for, are we empowered? Are we empowered? Are we empowered? They don't know what that looks like. Quickly on the heavenly side, Jesus is in the heavenly holy of holies, according to Hebrews, doing his great high priestly work. And at the end of it, He sits down at the right hand of the Father and having completed all that was necessary to become the head of the church through His own sacrifice, He sends His Holy Spirit into every one of His believers on earth. And we have the drama of Pentecost. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is born. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is empowered. And immediately the church of the Lord Jesus Christ begins to bear witness, and this is a key point for me as a former missionary, in the language of every lost person in the crowds. So what was the commandment on the Mount of Olives? You will be my witnesses. The vehicle for making witnesses and making disciples, the vehicle for making disciples comes from our bearing witness to everybody that we're around. It starts at home. Jesus says it to them as they stand on the mountain looking down on Jerusalem. See that down there? That's where you start. That's home base. It's not going to stop there, but that's where you start. This mandate has been given by the Lord of the church to all the church. In has implications for every place where God has planted a flock, including Hopewell Baptist Church. What does that mean for us? Specifically, we have a responsibility given by the Lord of the church to bear witness and make disciples in Watertown. And then in Savannah, and then in Hardin County, and then in Tennessee, and then in the United States. And we don't stop till we've reached the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, don't get the idea that as an individual congregation, we've been given the responsibility to reach the end of the earth. That's been given to His church globally. So we have to remember that Jesus reminded His disciples He had sheep that were of another fold. Sometimes as we go about the work that God has given us as Hopewell Baptist Church, we may gain the privilege of announcing His name where it has never been named before. But the probability is that we're going to be called to go alongside believers that He's already called into a relationship with Himself. Like Iglesia Roca Siglos, like Purpose Church. Wherever we are, whether Watertown or some African tribal village or some rocky peak in Nepal, two things remain constant. We bear witness to the one we know with the purpose of making disciples. What our pastor is giving me the privilege of doing is reminding us constantly of our marching orders to help us find new and innovative ways of bearing witness here and around the world to find new and innovative innovative ways to incorporate bearing witness and making disciples into the things we normally do as church. So that's the vision our pastors laid out to me and to the leadership of Hopewell. My prayer is that we have found the mind of Christ for this church. It is a privilege to serve among you as a fellow member. 
And it'll be even more of a privilege if I join your leadership team. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have been called by you together in a family of believers. And we have had as graphic example this week of what that means on the sad side. You let us know we weep when others weep. And we've wept and we've mourned. But we've arrived here on the Lord's Day. And if there's one message that comes from the Lord's Day, it is that you are the Lord over sin and over death and you have raised from the dead and that the enemy to us all is a defeated enemy and you're the victor. And so we come to you, our Savior and our Lord, and we ask you that you manifest yourself by your Spirit in this place today. And that as I pastor stands up and preaches from an old covenant that points toward you, that we would see you in all the things of that. We thank you for the music that's about to happen and the servants who lead us in worship from Richard and Billy and the other instrumentalists through the choir. And we thank you that you've called us all to serve together in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. Sing with me. The splendor of the King. He's clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God Stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, the Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. Great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great. And all will see how great, how 
Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for today. And Lord, I thank you for this congregation. And as Don mentioned earlier, Lord, I I watched this congregation be a family this week. To those that were hurting, people just coming and sharing words of encouragement and Or that's the picture that a lost world doesn't know. And that's why we need to go, so that they will see how great our God is and all those things we've sung about and all those things that Don just spoke about. And what Brother Carter's about to open, Lord, we pray. I pray that everyone in this room knows you as Lord and Savior and knows how great of a God you are. Great to the point that you sent Jesus to this earth to die in our place so that we could be reunited to the Father in eternal life that comes through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Your word tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, Father, and you were that perfect sacrifice on the cross for our redemption. And so now as Brother Carter comes, I pray that that Holy Spirit power that Brother Don talked about would have freedom in this room, that you would speak with Holy Spirit power through your word and through Brother Carter. We pray all this in the saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated, please. We have children's worship this morning, children's church, third grade and under, make your way forward. All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Leviticus chapter 16, is where we'll read from. We've been uh, walking through... Uh, the books of the Bible. So we are, are into the third book, and uh, certainly the one that <clears throat> most people uh, stop their Bible reading plan uh, sometime in late January, early February every year when you get to Leviticus. And if you make it through Leviticus, you stop in numbers. And if you say you don't stop in numbers, you're a liar. Uh, <laughs> No, it's, uh, it's, it's great reading, uh, and, and if you power through it, there's so much there. It, I'll be honest, it is written in a bit of a, a, a start and stop way. It not, doesn't necessarily naturally flow the best, but, but for the ancient Israelites, they clung to it very tightly, and so we would do well as we think through our new covenant through Christ Jesus, why Leviticus was so important to he and his kinsmen Uh, and what relevance it has for us today. Uh, So the sun is a necessary and incredible reality in our lives. Um, Richard and I, when we got here today, we arrived at the same time uh, this morning, and uh, his comment was, I don't like it when the sun doesn't rise in the morning, uh, when you're just covered by the overcast sky. Uh, obviously, it has just remarkable benefits and effects for all of us, but the sun is also very dangerous. Uh, if you stay outside in it too long without proper protection, uh, especially if you are redheaded, uh, you can be in a world of hurt, right? Uh, you can uh, look at it too long uh, if you are trying to look at an eclipse and burn your retinas out and no longer be able to see. So it is, uh, it's incredible, it's powerful, but it's also very dangerous, and you've got to understand how to properly engage and live under the sun. Well, what would you do if the sun showed up and said, I would like to take residence in your place of living, and I'm going to be right next to you? And rightly so, we would all be mortified and uh, die thereafter. 
Well, when you think about God and what he's doing with the Israelites here, in the book of Exodus, he calls them out of Egypt. He forms this nation, and, and he calls them and tells them, you are to be holy. You're to be set apart. And he gives Moses the, the design for this tent, this tabernacle. And, and there's two words, two ways of saying that. He'll say the, 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 the tabernacle or the dwelling is where God is going to reside with these people. But they also will refer to it as a tent of meeting. And so how do you meet with the holiest reality in all of the world? How do you meet with something more powerful than the sun? And you finish the book of Exodus, and it says that the glory of the Lord is in the tent of meeting, and, and Moses can't enter it. And therein lies the conundrum. God is there in the tent dwelling, but the people can't be with him. What do you do? How do you have hope? Because if you can't be with the creator and all of his goodness, then you don't have access to his power, his love, his mercy, so on and so forth. Well, Leviticus is the answer to that problem. Leviticus is the answer to how the Israelites are going to reside with this holiest of holy gods, uh, the only one true God, and how he is, the Israelites will walk through the wilderness with him. Now, everyone likes action movies a lot better than they like reading rule books. <laughs> and so for that reason, Genesis and Exodus get a lot more attention. If you've ever tried to put together like Ikea furniture or anything like that, uh, you know how badly rule books stink. Uh, but all in all, Leviticus has a beautiful structure to it. Uh, I appreciate good, good, like fine woodworking, and there's a, a skill in woodworking, a, a technique that you take a slab and you cut it down the middle and you, you flip it and it mirrors each other and it produces this beautiful effect where it's just this uh, kind of consistent pattern throughout that, that, that complements uh, the rest of the piece. Well, in a lot of ways, Leviticus serves in that manner. It, and so it's gonna, we're going to tackle it in three parts. This is a book of holiness. And it talks about a holy place, the holy priests, and a holy people. And it, and it kind of mirrors each other, those three sections, and then there's, it kind of hashes out those three things again in the second half of the book. And at the middle, the dead middle, is this book or this chapter on the Day of Atonement. And so it's really uh, put together well. It would make a, an A plus in a, an English class or a Hebrew class, I guess, technically. But anyway, the main idea of Leviticus would be this. God makes a way for people like us to live with him. God makes a way for people like us to live with him. And that seems so simple, but is actually probably the most profound statement I could tell you today, uh, which is why it would be the main idea. So if you have Leviticus 16, stand with me. We're going to start in verse 20. We're going to read through verse 22. This is referring to the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16, 20. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All right, so we begin discussing a holy place. Now, a lot of times when you think about the, I don't know if you think about this, but if you do, uh, you know, you think about the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and what that would have looked like. I'm sure if you've been in a Sunday school class, you've seen the diagram of it and so forth. And, and, and when you think about what's happening in Israel at this time, or, or the Israelite nation, they don't really inhabit the land yet. When you think about what's going on with them, God is, is allowing them to meet with him. This is primarily a book about how the people are going to meet with God. And, and so that starts, you think first and foremost, well, we're going to have to be forgiven of our sins. And yes, that is a, a big part. But more than that, it's a book about how sinful people can live in proximity to a sinful God. And so it's more nearly about what God is doing with these people and how he's residing with them in this holy place of meeting. And so the tabernacle requires sacrifice. 
The tabernacle is this holy place, and, and all the life of Israel will emanate out from this holy tabernacle, this tent of dwelling. And so it requires a sacrifice, the blood. And in this book, you hear God says that, that the blood of an animal is its life. And because of the uncleanness and the sin of the people, the, the, the life must be, cha- or must be placed uh, into a sacrificial system so that the uncleanness of the world is met into the holiness of God, and there has to be this blood that covers it and cleanses. And so the book starts off in the first six chapters, and it details the five ceremonial sacrifices that come with the life of Israel. Now, three of them are for atonement and guilt and sin and wrongdoing, those good Southern Baptist words (laughs) that you are probably very familiar with if you have been uh, uh, a Baptist for longer than, I don't know, a couple of weeks. Two of them are free will offerings that you make out of overflowing and gratitude. And so the, the, the book of Leviticus has very little story to it. It's a rule book. There's very little narrative to the whole thing. What it's there to do is to show us how uh, you engage this God and how you are in communion and fellowship with him. And so the first of these offerings, it's a burnt offering. Now I'm going a little bit out of order uh, because when you read the book, you kind of see that this was, I'm going to discuss them in the order you do them, and you'll see why here in just a second. The first offering is the burnt offering, and this is a total offering. And complete offering. You take an animal uh, relative uh, to your status. You bring it to God. And the only requirement is it has to be a, an animal of the herd. It cannot be a wild animal you caught. It's got to cost you something. It's got to be something that, that you cultivated. And then you said, well, I, I don't have a lot of money. All I've got is a dove. That's fine. But you had to raise that animal. And you can't just go out and say, oh, throw this one in here because uh, I found him. And it's got to be a, one without blemish. This has got to mean something to you. And you take it in here and, and you, you offer it as sacrifice. And this burnt offering is totally burnt, like completely consumed by uh, the priests as they offer it to God in the fire. What does this represent? A total dedication and commitment and surrender to what God's calling you to do. Is that not the Christian life? This call to, to lay it all before the Lord, to say, okay, I'm, I'm no, hold nothing back. I give you my finest. And so you come before the Lord, you offer this burnt offering all in. The second one is referred to as the sin offering. This would also be an animal and could be relative to your economic status, which is quite beautiful on the Lord's part. Because if you think about uh, every other religion and even our way of living in the world today, our society, uh, you got to climb the ladder you got to achieve more, get more, be more. But, but as God is laying out the, the Levitical worship, how he wants to be approached, he shows the whole world here through his people Israel, I don't care what you can afford. I don't care how you live in life. I don't care what your status is. Just that you come. Just that you come and you offer atonement. Uh, and so when you get to the New Testament and you hear about Jesus and his family and they're, they're offering a, a sacrifice of pigeons, uh, what does that tell you? That the Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ, was born into a family of lower economic standing. God does not care who you are or what you've got, only that you approach him. And so what you do is you come and the sin offering, it's really made for Uh, for sins that you commit that you don't really even know that you've committed. That's an interesting thought. Why don't you sit down today with an open journal and try to think back over your last week and and run your tally (laughs) and see how many sins you can guess you've committed. And then what Leviticus is telling you is you've committed a lot more than that that you don't even know about. And so you come before the Lord, you bring this animal, you are made aware of your sin, and there's levels to this. In Leviticus, it tells us that, that the priests are the, held to the highest standards, and they must uh, uh, pay restitution in their sin offering and be made aware of their sin to the highest degree because they represent God's people to God. And then it talks about leaders, probably leaders of local tribes, and if they are more sinful, they've got to have their sins made aware to them, and then lastly, the, all the people of Israel. What does this tell you? Well, this tells you that your sin needs to be addressed by you. 
And is that not difficult? No one loves this. No one likes this. But with confronting sin, there's peace and there's harmony. None of us want to hear how we have sinned. None of us want to be brought in our flesh. None of us want to be confronted and said, here's all the wrongdoing you've done. And yet God, at the very beginning of this book about approaching him, says that's going to be necessary. You're going to need to reckon with what you've done wrong in the world. And so then there's, uh, uh, they bring their animal. It's taken outside the camp, which is a key part to this, and completely burned, devoured. Uh, and then there's a guilt offering, which is, uh, sounds the same as sin, right? But, but a guilt offering is when you have transgressed someone else. And so you have guilt against them, and you must get, offer restitution to them. So if you steal from somebody, you've got to pay them back more than what they have, uh, you have taken from them. And then you've got to offer a sacrifice and more for what you have, the guilt you've incurred from that. This was always a ram, Leviticus tells us. Um, and then if you think about these three, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, all three of these is a, 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 a reality of, of a total surrender and buy-in to a complete and totally consumed sacrifice outside the camp because sin against God and against others. Well, is that not sending alarm bells off in your head? Because it should. Because it should, because there is a person who was born uh, several thousand years after this system was put in place. And this person's name was Jesus, and he lives a completely pure life, and yet he is totally consumed by death on the cross, outside of the holy city, outside of God's holy presence in the city. And he's done so because of the sins that you have committed and that I have committed against him. Jesus, in this, this idea of, of atoning sacrifice, you see him jump off the pages here and how this one is carried out. And then there are two more offerings. The grain offering, it's made for thanksgiving. Uh, the first fruits of your harvest, you give back to the Lord. Uh, and then the second one would be a peace offering. And this is an offering of communion. And this is the one that you go in, you make the offering, and then you were given some of it back and you go out into the outer part of the tabernacle and you eat this meal in the presence of the Lord. You have communion there in the tent of meeting before God. And so these two are, 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 are offerings of gratitude, of a way of saying thank you to God and drawing near to him. And so if you think about these two things together, these three offerings that are brutal and bloody and require the death of these animals, you think about that one. And then after that, you engage and enjoy in these two offerings of gratitude and, and communion. Well, what does that sound like? That sounds like being justified from our sins, being brought into a right relationship with God, being sanctified, having those sins carried off and away from you, and then unified to God and enjoying fellowship with him. Leviticus is, is nothing but a, a, a few thousand year old's forerunner of, of the new covenant that will come through Christ and his blood and what he offers us. And so you see him in this book. The goal of Genesis, when he writes, you know, right in the beginning, is that God desires to dwell with the image bearers he has created. That's Genesis. And, and, and the rest of the Bible is a story about how God's going to make that happen again. And so Leviticus is, is the Old Testament way of bringing that back into reality, that God, full of mercy, full of love, wants to be with you. Think about that. Think about that for a second. When we talk about the power of the sun, and you think about how dangerous it is, and the creator of that sun desires to know you deeply, and more nearly for you to know him deeply. That is astounding. That is absolutely breathtaking. And that's the system God is putting before them here. In Deuteronomy, and we'll get there in a few weeks, Moses says, what other nation has laws like these? Moses loves these laws because within them is, is the ability to approach God himself. And so in the life of a Christian, you see Christ as the fulfillment of all of these and so therefore, as you read Leviticus, you should appreciate Christ's righteousness so much and abhor your sin so deeply. 
And then, I don't have time to get into it, to, uh, but in chapters 23 through 25 is this holy place. Is, you know, we hear about these festivals, these feasts, these days of remembrance that Israel had. And you and I are called to remember the same through the, the communion, the Lord's Supper, as we take this, these elements together that Jesus instituted the night before he died. We remember regularly that Christ has come and fulfilled our sacrificial uh, responsibilities to the Lord. And so you have a holy place, the tabernacle. That's why they wanted this so deeply. And, and in a, uh, a few books from now, you understand why David says, why, God, why are you still living in this tent? I we need a house for you. And, and you understand why it is such a precious place to them and why the temple has been fought over and desired for so long because there and the holiest of holies, which is just an empty room bearing the Ark of the Covenant. There's been wars fought and, and entire empires fallen over that precious presence of God. The mistake is to think that you can approach it on your own or that I can approach it in my own way. And so because the holy place is necessary and you need to know it and how to achieve it and how to draw into communion with the God who inhabits it, we need holy priests. So chapters 8 through 10 and then chapters 21 through 22, those bookends, uh, they talk about the priests and what they must do. And these priests must engage in a regular daily uh, cleansing. They must have this intense attention to detail. Imagine if a pastor also had to be the finest teacher and instructor and knowledgeable in all the history and, and reality of the world. And he also had to be the best butcher you've ever seen. And he also had to be like type A about uh, cleanliness and, and, and a thousand other responsibilities and things that these priests were given the responsibility of. In chapter 8, Aaron, Moses' brother, he's consecrated as the high priest along with all of his offspring. Then chapters 21 and 22, it talks about the moral responsibilities of those priests, the intense scrutiny that they live under, and that they are held to the same standards as the offerings themselves. These priests, and this is not cruel of God, what he's trying to do is show us that, that he demands perfection, and not, not moral perfection, but, but this reality that, that he is perfect and, and the blemishes and, and the harshness of life here below uh, cannot be, uh, he cannot be brought into their presence quite like he can uh, anything else. And so what I mean by that is if you read into Leviticus 21 and 22, you'll see that, that these priests are told that if they have certain conditions, that they can't be uh, priests, that they have to be physically pure as well. And there's some moral implications there, but, but even the way they're born, God says, only the best for me. Now, you and I, we come to that and we think, that's harsh. That's harsh. Why, why can't someone with, with a, a certain disease be a priest? Why can't that happen? And the reason is because God is holy and he's not like you and me. And when we come before him, we can't approach him just willy-nilly in any way we want. You have to approach him on the terms that he sets and so these priests are given a, a high standard. They have to wash daily. They have to wear special clothes. And then another thing they do in Leviticus 10, the priests are to teach the people the statutes of God. And we think about the sacrifices because those are the goriest and, you know, those, that grabs our attention. But, but you've got to think that the teaching was probably the thing that most of them engaged in most of the time. And so you see that even here at the foundation of Israel, teaching God's word is, is a big deal that you and I must pay attention to. And so the priests in some ways, in some, function as uh, the same way that maybe our pastors and elders and teachers of the church do today. James tells us that not many of us should desire to be teachers of the law. Why? Because we incur a harsher judgment on ourselves. And so we're held to a, a tremendously high standard, and you as a church should never lower that standard. That when you read in, in 1 Timothy and in Titus about what the qualifications are for an elder and an overseer, that you for not one second deviate from what those requirements are, that they should be above reproach. 
And so that is on us in this New Testament age we live in. It's a wonderful reality that, that we are not stuck with whatever priests we get, but instead we get to understand they are held to a high standard and they should teach truth and they should regard God in all of his holiness. But in the, more so, more so than, than pastors and elders being priests of the Old Testament, you are a priest from the Old Testament. That great Reformation doctrine that was held on to so tightly is that there's a priesthood of all believers. Everybody, you, me, anybody indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 2 tells us that, that God has called us a chosen race, a royal priesthood. And in Revelation 5, we hear that the angels worshiping Jesus and they tell him, you have called us to be priests of God to the world. You are a priest of God if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. And so you know what that means? It means in Leviticus, when you read about the holiness of the priests, you should regard your own holiness that same way. Aaron's offspring, the Levites, were living sacrifices to the, the Lord. And guess what? You are called in the New Testament, a living sacrifice. Everything about you is dedicated and consecrated to the Lord. And so you should take that in tremendously seriously. The two roles of the priests, to present God's people to God and to present God to God's people. And if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, a Christian, you have that same obligation here today. Because of what Don just read from the Great Commission, you have been commissioned out to, to show the world who God is and to bring the world to God and show them how to clean up and have a seat at his table through Christ Jesus the Lord. That should terrify all teachers of, the, of God's word. Every pastor, every Sunday school teacher should be terrified of that responsibility. But also you as well, as someone who's been called to be a part of this royal priesthood of God. But more than anything, the holy priest should point us to God himself in the form of Christ Jesus. Christ is our great high priest. Hebrews is, is quick to tell us all about this, how we have a, a high priest who knows us. Think about this. Aaron and his offspring were not allowed to have any other jobs, but daily be making intercession for the people. And so if you are a shepherd and you've had to work hard, or you're a shepherd's wife and you've had a hard life, and, and you come dragging up your, the best you have, and, and this priest stands before you and he goes, nah, I don't think so. That, that, that one, I, 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 don't, I don't accept that sacrifice. And that priest could be crooked. That priest could be wicked and take a bribe. Who knows? You're sitting here looking at this, you think, this guy has no idea what daily life is like for an average Israelite. But guess what? Jesus does. He doesn't just know from his uh, knowledge as God, but he knows because he's lived it. He's lived it. He's lived the, 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 the grind of being a human being in this fallen world. To know illness, to know loss, to know disappointment, to know hurt. He knows all of that, and he still accepts himself as sacrifice as our great high priest before God. He knows. The great high priest, he would have to sacrifice for himself, atone for himself, because he himself was imperfect. But our great high priest needs no atonement for himself, but rather offers himself for us. And lastly, a holy people. Now, this is a big bulk of the book is on the laws for the Israelites. This regards the people's holiness. They're being set apart for God. In the first section, 11 through 15, chapters 11 through 15, they regard ritual purity. And they list all sorts of things like skin diseases, which foods are clean, why you can't eat certain bugs, but others you can, and you better not cook that barn owl that you found. <laughs> And it, it refers to intimacy between spouses and, and, and bodily discharges. And there's a lot of interesting reading material there. And what he's trying to do, God is trying to delineate what is clean and what is unclean. And this doesn't necessarily mean sinful and, and, and not sinful. What he's trying to show in chapters 11 through 15 is, is there are just functions of everyday life that are going to render you unclean. Like if you touch a dead body. Well, if you're a, a, a mortician, you've got to do that. 
Like there's just certain things that you can't get away from. And so you can become clean again. It doesn't mean that you're awful. It just means that you have uh, become ritually unclean and you must be cleansed. And so the point is not to be perfect. The point is to be reminded how human we are and how holy God is. And almost everything that separates clean from unclean has some vestige of death attached to it. An animal that would eat another animal. Uh, a, a discharge of blood that would signify the loss of life. It, it was all about clinging to the goodness of life. That is what the moral and pure laws refer to. And there's an order and a purpose to God. And when he says four times in this book, be holy because I am holy, then what that means is every single thing you do should come under the lordship of God. There's not one thing you're going to do this week that God doesn't have an intention and a design behind. Think about that. The way you young people in here, you got girlfriends and boyfriends. Guess what? God's got a design for how to do that. The way you go to work tomorrow, the way you engage and how you interact with your coworkers, God has a design and an intention for how you should live with that. Your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with the world, the way you handle your finances, the way what you say when something wrong happens to you, how you eat, your calorie intake, and you think that's ridiculous. No, it's not. It's Leviticus. That's what it is. God cares about every millisecond of your life. Everyone. Not just your prayers, not just your holy moments, not just your getting dressed up and coming to church, but, but he cares about every single inner working of your mind and your heart. What does Christ tell us in the Sermon on the Mount? I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And if anything, he expands it into the, the very marrow of our being and the working of our hearts. If you say, well, I don't think I want to be a part of that, then you are not fit to be one of God's holy people. And you will encounter the death of life every single day around you with no hope, no ability to engage God's goodness therein. If you think about a, you're sitting around a campfire. Let's say you've got your, your, your whole families around you and, and you're sitting there and, and, and the Canaanites that you just uh, traded with, they were eating some bacon-wrapped shrimp and it smelled delicious. And your, your kid comes up to you and says, Dad, why, why are we having to have this bland lamb? We've had this every day for the last two months. Why can't I have some of that bacon-wrapped shrimp? And you sit there and you say, well, son, first and foremost, because God has said what we should and shouldn't have. Now, as we refer to delicious food, that is one thing. But as you refer to every square inch of your life, Look at the gospel ability you have. Hey, why don't we do these things? Why can't we live the way they live? Why, why do we have to do these things? Why? And you sit there and you're just able to tell the world around you, because God has called me to do this. Because I'm called to be holy. And yes, there are reasons for it. It's probably more hygienic to live according to the Old Testament law. They were probably soil benefits to doing it. God knew about crop rotation. 4,000 years ago. But more than that, it's simply because our Father in heaven has told us to do it. And that is the reason why. The second section extends into the moral implications of God's laws, how you're to treat one another. And you got to understand, these people have been in Egypt for a long time. And they saw a lot of Egyptian worship and they saw a lot of Egyptian culture. And God calls them out of that and says, now you got to live totally different than how you've been for the last 400 years. And you're going into a land where people are going to worship totally differently than how I want you to worship. And so you got to know how you're to treat one another. And so Leviticus uh, uh, 18 through 20 has some of the most uh, offensive things to you and I. It should challenge every single one of us in here about how we live. It, it offers the, the highest expectations and degree of sexual integrity. And, and it harkens back to basically say, uh, uh, you get to the end of the section on sexual integrity and you say, well, well what can you do? Well, what you can do is, is God's original design in the garden that Adam and Eve love one another for life. One man, one woman, and, and no one else. 
And you finish that section and you think, well, how, how prudish, how conservative, how whatever. And, and then God says, no, 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 by the way, when foreigners come into your place, you got to treat them with the utmost respect. In fact, I expect you to leave fruit on the vine for them to gather. They don't speak your language. They don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They don't even worship me. But you better not pluck the end of your crops because I expect you to leave some for them. And you think, well, gosh, that sounds like, right. You see what's happening here? That God's people are not called to, to encamp themselves in, in the spectrum of the world, but to be plucked out of that world and said, here are your expectations. To live according to the nature and character of God. To love your neighbor as yourself. To treat your workers fairly. To pay them well. And then the, an intense, int I mean intense warning against child sacrifice against expending the lives of, of innocent babies and children for uh, demonic practices and, and enjoyment. And so you read Leviticus 18 through 20, and you should walk away from that. You should say, wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? Because you look at your own heart, when I look at mine, when I look at the society we live in, when I think about the history of the world, it is not like Leviticus 18 through 20. It makes sense why Moses looks around at this pagan Canaanite worship and he thinks about where they came from out of Egypt and he says, look at our laws. We, we have the, the character of God available to us. We could go on for a long time on this, but what's the point? The point is all of your life matters. All of your life matters. So you finish Leviticus, and you think, what is that all about? That's a rule book, and I've broken pretty much every single one of them. <laughs> How do we ascend the hill of the Lord? How can we dwell in his holy habitation? Well, right in the middle, Leviticus 16. We read this at the start of the message. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. What would happen? A priest would come in, he would sanctify himself, he would offer atonement for himself, and then he would take two goats, and he'd take one goat, he would uh, kill it, and he would offer its blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant to uh, atone for the sins of all the people. And, and, and then he would take the second goat, and he would place his hands over it, and he would impute the sin of all of Israel onto this goat, and they would send it away out into the wilderness, never to be seen again. What's happening here? Well, we have a couple of IT guys here, I know, that work in IT, more than a couple. Uh, and they'll tell you the number one calls they get, the, the answer is majority of the time, what? Unplug it, plug it back in, Right? <laughs> This is a reboot, a yearly perpetual reboot that Israel has to undergo to be reset as they pursue the Lord. And this blood is interesting because it's not covering the people. It's covering the ark. The blood is not applied to the people themselves. The blood is applied to the mercy of God. So the people are not covered in the blood, literally, but yet they are covered by the blood as it is uh, interceding for them before God. And then their sin is placed on this scapegoat. That's where we get that word. A scapegoat that is then shoved out into the wilderness away from God's holy, perfect presence because sin must be far away. What is that? That is how Christ has redeemed you and it's how he's redeemed me. That he himself has, has borne my sin and, and on the cross shedding his own blood has purchased my redemption. Not because his blood has, is worth mine or not because I am literally covered by his blood, but because his blood has been accepted by God in his mercy and then I reap all the benefits of that precious, perfect blood and I pay no consequence because Christ himself marches out of Jerusalem carrying a massive tree upon which he is hung up to die outside of God's holy presence. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And so when you think about this and you read Leviticus and you think, oh my gosh, this book's terrible. It's so boring. There's so much blood. Who could ever do this? The answer is Jesus. The answer is Christ Jesus the Lord who loves us and gave himself 
for us. Because you and I are now the holy place of God. The temple of God does not reside in a a physical place now, but but has been rebuilt by Christ within us. And we are also holy priests of God, serving under the great high priest, King Jesus himself, because he has made us a holy people to be set apart from him, to live in union and communion with him. Why? Because he has entered to where we cannot go. Because God, who desires to live with us, says eventually this Levitical system wears out. And it does. This is not a unilateral covenant. God God tells him at the end of Leviticus, if you don't keep all this stuff, I'm going to go away from you. And they have wicked high priests. They have wicked kings. and, and, And as the people are just subject to that, and the people are wicked themselves. And there's just all this evil, and and eventually God does, the glory of the Lord departs from Israel. Ichabod. And what happens? The Lamb of God comes, and John knew this, and he cries out, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Praise the Lord for that. If you do not have that Lamb's blood covering you, then you remain in your penalty. You remain in your penalty under the the unclean and impure and sinful nature of of your life. And and you are not welcome in the camp. And I don't mean that ugly. Uh, I don't mean that. I mean that that God has called a holy people to himself. But what I will say is this. To get in, it's already been paid for. The Day of Atonement has come and passed. And what used to have to be done every single year is now over. It has been paid for once and for all and is accessible to anybody. It came at great price, but a price that you need not pay because Jesus did so. Why? Because he loves you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you that in this book of confusion and, and or not confusion necessarily but, but maybe just a book that's hard to read sometimes and hard to understand thank you that here we stand in the year of our Lord 2024 a holy people a royal priesthood that we are the temple of the living God may we always live up to that standard and when we don't May we cling to the blood that was shed for us and understand that Christ Jesus has taken our burden. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. May we come to him, all who are weary, and he will give us rest. We ask these things in Christ's name.